Good morning, everyone, and thank you. I'm Martin Hirsch, a locum consultant gynaecologist at Oxford University Hospitals and an honorary fellow of Oxford University. Thank you, Suzanne, and the team for inviting me to talk today. It's an honor uh, to be presenting in such esteemed company, and I'll add that I have the hardest and broadest talk of the day on how to perform and report a laparoscopy for endometriosis. It's a great blank slate to start with, and I hope you all enjoy the presentation. On the topic of reporting, I'd like to start with my declaration. Endometriosis is a complex disease with three main disease forms, peritoneal, ovarian, and deep disease that can occur in isolation or together. These disease subtypes can often cause pain and difficulties falling pregnant, and surgery is a recognized treatment. The limited accuracy of non-invasive diagnostic tests often means that we're blinded to what we're about to find at the time of surgery. And trying our best to improve matters, we must acknowledge that sometimes things don't go wrong and only retrospectively do we realise that our decisions were not correct. I hope in this talk um, we can address how best to plan and deliver a laparoscopy to prevent things from going wrong. Uh, and there'll be a particular focus on deep disease as the planning, team skills and risk associated with superficial disease a lot less. And I hope this talk will also help everyone avoid this situation. In this short talk, I'll cover decision making, preoperative planning, operative setup, intraoperative review, postoperative report, and postoperative planning. The decision to proceed with surgery is arguably the most complex and hardest to make. The approach of one consultant visit, one click, and one operation, while desired by many of our managers, is not possible with this complex disease. The limited non-invasive and accurate tests available to diagnose endometriosis preoperatively makes surgical planning and consent very difficult. Matthew's given a fantastic presentation demonstrating the possibilities of what can be achieved with expert skill, but the reality is that the level of skill, this level of skill is limited to very few expert centres. We certainly hope the infectivity and our number of Matthew's skill will grow rapidly uh, around, the, the, around the world. As a surgeon, high accuracy ultrasound or MRI can greatly assist with counselling as the majority of surgical risks relate to deep disease or ovarian disease. You can provide realistic expectations of what will be performed and what the goals will be uh, that we're hoping to achieve from any surgical procedure. Whether this is improvement in pain, um, and the recent Cochrane review concluded that uh, it's uncertain whether surgery benefits pain, uh, and there remains little evidence to demonstrate uh, surgical removal of isolated superficial peritoneal endometriosis improves overall symptoms or quality of life. Is the goal to improve fertility? A review concluded that you require to perform surgery on 12 women with endometriosis for one additional pregnancy. And with the limited preoperative uh, diagnostic accuracy, this equates to between 20 and 24 surgical procedures to treat those 12 women. This decision making doesn't need to be burdened just on one person's shoulders and an MDT decision reviewing the history, the imaging and the patient's priorities enables a shared decision making and a shared risk layer to often challenging consultations. The input of a colorectal surgeon for preoperative planning or counselling or consent is recommended where there's a high risk of bowel surgery. It is essential that at the end of this decision-making process to clearly document the intended benefits of the surgery, the patient-specific risks, and the alternatives that have been discussed. We need to remember that this is quality of life surgery on the whole, and the decision to proceed with high-risk surgery should be patient-led unless there is ureteric or bowel obstruction where it be medically indicated. Once a decision has been made for surgery, the type of surgery, route of surgery and the goals of surgery, the planning really needs to start to optimise uh, that patient achieving the goals that you've been set and safely. In some sectors, this may include agreed weight loss prior to surgery, a liaison with appropriate medical teams, uh, and surgical specific plans that I've incorporated into my practice include the use of gonadotropin releasing hormone analogues for 12 weeks prior to surgery for rectovaginal disease. And this is supported by NICE guidance here in the UK provides the patient and doctor with confidence as a test of cure if their pain improves and subjectively also reduces disease volume and blood supply. Coordinating a date when multiple specialties are available can often be challenging in current NHS practice. And the use of 
bowel emptying medication varies nationally and internationally without clear guidance. From a professional experience of working with colorectal surgeons, an empty bowel is a lot easier to operate with and reduces the requirement for an ileostomy if the lumen is opened. So on the day you've seen the patient, you're about to start your WHO, and having ensured that all medical aspects are in place, you need to discuss the technical components. For endometriosis surgery deep in the pelvis, you need an ability for the patient to go head down 30 degrees in Trendelenburg and hopefully not slip. You need a non-slip mat or a bean bag, as we've all had cases where a slight slip upwards towards the anaesthetist has meant that we cannot antivert the uterus and therefore we cannot access the pouch of Douglas. These small pre-op steps can make a huge difference to efficiency intraoperatively. Leg positioning in Lloyd Davis is crucial and ensuring someone is mindful that the legs don't straighten or catch on surrounding scrub trolleys is essential to avoid injury. I often ask for an OG or an NG tube if entering at Palmer's Point to deflate the stomach if they've had previous open surgery or other factors I'll talk about in a moment. I ask for the arms to be wrapped by the sides to avoid any restrictions on the range of movement of the instruments that can occur when the arms are on the chest. The route of entry will depend on the disease location and prior surgery, as the risk of adhesions at the umbilicus following one or more fan and steel is up to 20%, with a third of these, or 7% uh, of all cases with a fan and steel will have adhesions with a significant risk of bowel injury. I'd recommend considering Palmer's point entry for the extremes of BMI, previous open surgery, large endometrioma, fibroid uteri, or umbilical hernia repair. Unfortunately, there's been no standardization for the recommendations for, for pelvic assessment based on disease distribution. In the UK, consultant Said Hafser of Kingston University Hospital and past president of the BSG, Dominic Byrne from Cornwall, are trying to standardize the assessment process to enable greater ease of comparison and recognition where there are abnormalities when a patient might be referred from a secondary care or a general gynecologist to a hospital of of tertiary level or specialist endometriosis centre. SRA define a good quality laparoscopy should include systematic checking of the uterus and adnexa, the peritoneum of the ovarian fossa and uterovicycle fold, the pouch of Douglas and pararectal spaces, the rectum and sigmoids as they can be isolated nodules in these locations without dense adhesions. The appendix and cecum should be inspected as well as extra pelvic locations such as the diaphragm. There should also be a speculum examination and palpation of the vagina and cervix under laparoscopic control to check for buried nodules. A good quality laparoscopy can only be performed by using at least one secondary port for a grasper to clear the pelvis of bowel or for suction to, to remove fluid from the pouch of Douglas. This image here shows a suggested um, series of images from the diaphragm to an overall view anterior and posterior pelvis, ovarian fossae, uterosacral ligaments, and the pouch of Douglas, as well as the appendix. For example, here's uh, evidence of suspected stage one uh, peritoneal or superficial endometriosis with clear vesicular lesions uh, that are common and suggestive of endometriosis and are more common in an adolescent population. While a negative laparoscopy has a high accuracy to exclude disease, these findings here carry a false positive rate of up to 50%. I'd love to be able to say this is endometriosis and this isn't, um, but the reality that we all face is much harder. An excision and sending the disease off or suspected disease off for histology is recommended. There is increasing accuracy uh, with visualization with increasing disease severity, depth of invasion and width of lesion. This image shows evidence of a powder burn lesion, which represents a slightly older lesion, more advanced and is less common in the adolescent population. This highlights both red and clear vesicular lesions uh, together on the right uterosacral ligament. And this is evidence of what we call a peritoneal Allen Masters window that are often diagnostic of endometriosis. But this disease, isn't just difficult with the early stages um, and deep disease can often be buried as I previously mentioned and it can be difficult to uh, assess and diagnose and what you see is often just the tip of the iceberg. In this video we can see an initial review um, where you think perhaps the disease was not that severe, uh, she appears to have normal adnexa but if you're looking really carefully 
you may see um, slightly dilated right ureter, the right, the left ovary is adherent to the right, to the left uterosacral ligament, and there's no obvious uterosacral arch, and the pouch of Douglas is obliterated. We start here on the right with uterolysis. Um, and if you uh, do incidentally or unexpectedly uh, encounter deep disease at the time of surgery, I'd recommend assessing whether the skills, resources and appropriate consent has taken place um, to proceed then and there. If not, perform a diagnostic lap laparoscopy with the images that I've suggested previously, um, request a high quality ultrasound or MRI and a discussion at your local or regional MDT to assess the disease severity and appropriate location for any future treatment. In this case, you can quickly see how the fibrotic disease is encasing the ureter, um, preventing or minimizing ongoing urethralysis. We move on to the right pararectal space. Uh, you can see here very healthy, clean tissue. The dissection proceeds with relative ease down into the um, pelvis, um, where unfortunately it's no longer able to proceed as the bowel is densely adherent to the right uterosacral ligament. In this situation, we're using ovarian suspension to enable maximum use of all our instruments, and we're using a rectal sizer to maximize manipulation of the rectum. After complex cases like this, it's important to use safety checks such as filling the rectum with gas to ensure there's not been a breach. Uh, or a leak uh, prior to finishing your procedure. The severity of this disease was expected um, as this patient had both had initial ultrasound demonstrating a large rectal nodule of endometriosis seen here in the anterior wall, as well as a confirmatory MRI. I'll put my hand up and say that I routinely get an MRI where I'm suspecting bowel disease as I find the anterior posterior measurement or the depth of invasion of the nodule within the rectal muscularis is a good guide to the complexity of the surgery you're likely to anticipate. In a large series uh, published in the Journal of Minimally Invasive Gynecology of over 5,000 patients with deep endometriosis, a cutoff value of seven millimeters of depth was highly predictive of requiring bowel opening in the form of a discoid or a segmental resection where complete excision of the endometriosis was required. As a document, the operation note requires concentration and after a long endometriosis case, this can often be hard. Um, I'll often get some food or a drink uh, to hydrate and refresh myself before starting and, and reconcentrating on the note. The operation note needs to include who was present, what findings were on entry, um, specific locations of the disease um, shown here in this picture and described previously. What instruments were used, what energy and dissection was performed, um, and what was sent to the laboratory. Were there any difficult intraoperative decisions requiring an additional consultant opinion? And details of requirements of future surgery are essential. Is the patient suitable for repeat conservative surgery? Would she require JJ stent insertion after having had her second or third urethralysis already? And for those using electronic records, be cautious about using pre-populated templates uh, to avoid including excessive information. I separate the post-operative plan into three clear sections. The immediate plan, can they eat and drink? What's their analgesia regime? Low molecular weight heparin or antibiotics ongoing? Then the plan or requirements prior to discharge. Catheter out, day two, mobilising, pain controlled, observations normal, bloods, um, uh, are okay before going home. Then the long-term plan. Should they be starting hormone therapy and at, at what time point? Where should they go if they become unwell in the post-operative period? At home and when should they be seen again and by whom? Take-home message is that endometriosis surgery requires careful counselling and planning after accurate imaging. Surgery should not be used in isolation and both ultrasound and MRI are essential tools to exclude deep or ovarian disease and then risk assess the complexity of surgery for those with deep disease. I present here a pathway that I try and follow um, to ensure efficient and appropriate allocation of case complexity to the surgeon, minimizing repeat procedures or incomplete surgical treatment. Thank you very much for your time and I hope you have a great day.